so from a general public perspective or from a sort of philosophical perspective, mm -hmm. it's already not completely clear what it means for something to be random. Mm -hmm. right? um, and, in, and in a way, as a mathematician, <laughs> we don't really care that much about it. The sort of philosophical aspect of whether you know are there random things in the world or not, or so, you know, in some sense for for a mathematician that's completely unrelated because I mean there's a very precise mathematical theory that sort of deals with probabilities and but absolutely no question of how the thing is set up. I mean there's only one reasonable way of setting things up and it's sort of clear that it's the correct definitions and so on. And so there's a completely well-defined mathematical theory and there's absolutely no controversy at all about whether that's sort of the correct way of approaching randomness or not from a mathematical point of view. Um, then there's the question of whether, you know, does that apply to reality? Right? I mean, does your mathematics actually describe something in the real world or not? Which, to some extent, as a mathematician, don't really care so much about right? so, so the mathematics is self-contained and it's consistent um, in many cases it does seem to apply to the real world and you know, people do apply it to the real world very successfully uh, and so we're happy about that but it's not really our job in some sense, right? mm -hmm. so it's uh, so out of the sort of more self-contained in the mathematical world rather than, than in the sort of applications to the real world um, but now random process in general is basically just uh, something that evolves with time but in a random way. Right? Um, so you could, you know, one example would be just, I don't know, if you look at sort of the smoke that comes out of a chimney. Right? If you look at the smoke, it's sort of, you know, it evolves actually in a random way. There's basically no reasonable deterministic way of predicting the exact shape of your smoke plume that comes out of your chimney, right? Uh, and so the uh, the most reasonable way of actually predicting it is just by you know predicting probabilities that it will do a certain thing or certain other thing. Right? Um, well, so again, so actually, so, at a, so if you believe in quantum mechanics, then at a very basic level, you believe that nature itself is random, actually. Mm -hmm. right? So if you take Newton's laws, also, right? if you take 19th century physics, the laws are deterministic and it sort of tells you that everything is completely determined. If you, you know, if you were this, if you were God and you knew everything in the world exactly at this instant, you could predict the whole future in theory. Um, if you believe in quantum mechanics, then that's not the case. No, right? so then it, it tells you that, well, if you, <coughs> if you send a photon to this beam splitter, then it's going to go right with probability a half, it's going to just go straight with probability a half. And there's absolutely no way for you to, you know, you can be completely omniscient and, and know everything about that photon, there's absolutely no way that even in theory you could predict whether it will go right or straight. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so you can actually, people do actually use this to produce perfect random number generators. But, you know, you want to produce somehow a perfect random number generator that gives you a random number which is somehow guaranteed to be unpredictable. Mm -hmm. right? sort of like, even if you had perfect knowledge about everything, you couldn't predict that number. So that certainly seems to work. So I mean, so there is a pretty good evidence that at some fundamental level, nature is actually random. So, so in that sense, there, but the, but in most cases, the type of randomness that you know you use or you, I mean, that you use probability for isn't necessarily somehow fundamental randomness that kind of comes from sort of fundamental laws of nature, but it's more about kind of incomplete knowledge. And, so, so, so that's the sort of randomness where, in principle, if you really knew everything, then you know you could somehow predict it, but you just don't know because it's impossible to have that knowledge, right? I mean, it's like the randomness that comes. I mean, like the Brownian motion that I showed. So that one is a sort of classical randomness in the sense that 
if you knew the locations of every molecule of water <laughs> in the glass that has the pollen particles, right, and the glass were perfectly isolated from the rest, then these molecules do basically behave like little billiard balls, and that's a pretty good approximation. And so you could, in theory, predict actually the motion of these, but you don't know, right? Um, and so, so there, the randomness actually rather models sort of incomplete knowledge rather than fundamental randomness of the process. Well, I mean, it's really an idea from theoretical physics, right, which sort of says that um, with sort of the day-to-day -day observation that, for example, I know, like fluids, for example, they all behave in the same way, right? So if you look at them very microscopic, microscopically, they would actually look very different, right? But when you look at things at large scales, they actually all look the same or, or almost the same. And they're described by very few parameters, like the viscosity for a fluid or something like that. Right? Um, and so it's a, it's a similar thing in probability theory here. Where, you know, in many situations when you're interested in you know, sort of what happens at large scales, sort of aggregate information in some sense, uh, it doesn't really matter too much about the, you know, the very precise details of the mechanism that produces it, as long as sort of the broad strokes are there. So, uh, 